Okay, everybody, welcome. And uh, we are graced by Patrick McAvoy, in addition to regulars, Andrew, Corbin, and Jan. Uh, just a very brief history now that these are being recorded and posted. This call in this form has been up since 2018, I believe September. And we meet every week with a focus on developers one week and then on production users the next week. And that simply means that a developer gets the floor first on the developer call, but we happily di diversify into topics like ZFS, which is often used by the majority of Beehive users. So uh, how about we have a small group right now. So how about you each very briefly introduce yourselves, especially Patrick? No. Uh, well, I'll start then. Uh, Pat McAvoy, the, um, the, I do the streaming for, for uh, BSD Can and your BSD Con. Uh, that's pretty much how people know me. And I'm the guy who pesters people to do nice bug talks when we are actually meeting and having talks in person or online. And that's the New York City BSD users group, is it not? Yes, nice bug, yes. Cool. Uh, Andrew. My name oh. is Andrew. Hello. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> My name is Andrew Hedinger. Um, I work for Prominic.net. We use um, Beehive pretty extensively on OmniOS. So we're the, the Illumo side of things. I am far more user than developer. And kernel code is definitely way beyond me. So. Understood, Jan. Or Corbin, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, it's entirely up to you. So hi, I'm Corvin. I'm working for Back of Automation and we are doing uh, some real-time stuff on top of FreeBSD and um, I'm working there um, on Beehive, and I'm developing some features like GPU pass-through or a TPM emulation for Beehive. Excellent. And Jan, it's up to you if you want to say something. Emulsion. No problem. Corvin, as a developer, I would love to give you the floor to give any reports on, say, your OVMF work, your TPM work, and other very cool things. So I did some progress on the ACPI, um, on some t ACPI table improvements. And so now I'm going to uh, work on adding support to OVMF to load the ACPI tables from Beehive because at the moment OVMF has some own static tables and they don't change. But um, it would be better if OVMF uses the ACPI tables provided by Beehive because Beehive has much more information about the emulated hardware. And for example, if you want to use a TPM device, you have to add a TPM table. And so you somehow have to tell OVMF if you're using a TPM or not. And the easiest way is to just let OVMF use the ACPI table and then OVMF don't have to care about the hardware. Is there, from what you can tell, a clear reason that that's not in upstream OVMF? I think no one is just working on that. And um, so I have a patch for it and I can send it to OVMF, but there's, I already sent it to the virtualization list, mm -hmm. um, but where there was some feedback that, f um, so the main reason was that one ACPI table isn't generated by Beehive, but by OVMF and 
we don't know if some user rely on it. So um, at the moment, I'm preparing a patch to create this ACPI table. And if that's merged in uh, FreeBSD, I can send the patch to OVMF and we can switch over uh, to that. Cool. That is fantastic news. Have, has the project been good to work with? The OVMF project? Not responsive. So yeah, the OVMF project is very responsive from the QEMU side. Mm -hmm. And um, so most parts of OVMF um, are from QEMU. So you get some feedback from them. But it's a bit problematic with the review with some review from uh, some FreeBSD developers. But uh, in the past, it was doable. So I haven't good. I haven't sent many patches to OVMF yet, but most of them uh, were reviewed. Yeah. Got it. Cool. Uh, do you have anything you want the group to test? So not yet. Got it. Cool. Anything else to share? Um, yeah, one interesting topic is that uh, John's vCPU work landed, but I've saw it already in the notes. So I think it's will be a topic uh, from you. This is true. So yeah, I'm happy to jump into those uh, in a sec. So yeah, uh, I, that's indeed exciting. Uh, so cool. Let's get to that in context. And Jan, do you want to briefly introduce yourself to Patrick? You probably met in Vienna. Uh, sorry. Uh, sure. I had to uh, take another call. No problem at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm mostly a production user, but I'm not afraid to double in a code I shouldn't touch. Um, Nicely put. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> right now, uh, the most interesting problem uh, project I'm working on for this group is probably uh, provisioning uh, Beehive guests under S six RC supervision with Ansible. Um, that part is working, but I want to write my own uh, Ansible modules because it's getting too slow. <laughs> to a provision. I don't fancy waiting two or three minutes. Understood. Oh, actually, I don't need that. I will see if Daniel's around just for kicks. He's been pretty darn involved. Uh, so, um, Okay, that said, um, yeah, Jan has done some very cool work, especially with uh, the CTL infrastructure on FreeBSD backing the storage for virtual machines. And in doing so, he found a rather unusual issue where SCSI tags are being truncated. And I will just interject with my news item that I talked to Mav this week, and he very much has that on his to-do list after he wraps up something else. So. Uh, Alexander Moten was very helpful in working with Jan and I to identify what's going on. We kind of just had a quick meeting and figured it out. So that's, I think, the value of meetings like this. Thank you, Alexander. Um, I will just throw in my updates, uh, perhaps holding off on, on the vCPU for last, but hey, uh, I have actually encoded the recent movies and have a new workflow. And by movies, I mean recordings of these meetings. And uh, I have posted them to the BeehiveCon YouTube channel, which I set up a few years ago to have, say, uh, Tokyo videos. So I've put a link in the notes there. And that does not seem too difficult to maintain. And the, actually, for what it's worth, the YouTube interface has made some huge progress uh, over the last few years since I last used it. So. Uh, I welcome your feedback on that, and I also gently updated the beehive.org website to match. So if anything, I'm just posting the, the videos there because they are uh, hopefully in, in, in very inclusive to people. Uh, 
folks like Jason Tubner in, in Australia couldn't attend with the time change. And so we do our best to reach out to everybody. Uh, moving along, yeah, that's probably for Daniel, but there's been some good discussions on jailing NFSD and to some degree, things like uh, also CTL and iSCSI and, and fiber channels. So that's interesting, but not directly related to Beehive. Uh, and also a few weeks ago, Alan Jude jumped on and mentioned that Clara is willing to look at the 9P client. And uh, I heard back from Steve at Juniper. They certainly have it out there and there is interest, but there's not a super focused concerted effort on that. So hopefully some progress will come out of that. And then the big news that Corbin correct mentioned is that the November 23rd FreeBSD current release engineering snapshot includes John's vCPU work. And I have been quite excited for this in so far as when you need to build a completely different OS quickly, such as uh, a two revisions back or two revisions ahead in theory, FreeBSD version. The only way to really do that is in a clean environment and rather than hardware installing, it's nice to just leave the host one or two CPUs, leave one or two free for the guest, and then use everything else for the build. So I spun up my Epic system and uh, gave, as an attempt to compare the two, I did 44 uh, build threads such that the host built with 44, the VM built with 44, with a little overhead for each, leaving like two and two and four vCPUs. And I put the times it took to do the build. They weren't as narrow as I was truly hoping, but hey, it's brand new code. Maybe there are opportunities to optimize it. I did notice that when you built boot a, a VM with uh, say 44 vCPUs, it hesitates when it's setting up perhaps a, uh, what is it, the APIC there. So it's, I put in the notes, the event timer, stalls and that's launching VC, launching APs, that takes a few seconds, which Corbin, you might have some insights on what's going on there, but it worked above all. And uh, let's cover that before discussing the, the uh, sys control, which I have some questions about. Corvin, do you know what, oh, and Jan, you have a question. You're welcome to jump in also. You mentioned a, uh, clean environment. And by clean environment, I mean, say, building FreeBSD 9 on FreeBSD 9 release with zero possibility of contamination from, say, 14 is what I mean by clean. Uh, Corbin, any news, thoughts, uh, observations there? No, not yet. OK. Is the, uh, might you know what say takes place when launching APs? Because that took several seconds, whereas the boot is otherwise very fast. Is it building tables? Is it probing? What's it doing? It shouldn't do such much. So um, does it take a long time to um, uh, boot up each single AP or? Are there some which take a long time and some are very fast? It gives me that one uh, that one message of launching APs with all the numbers and then it just sits there doing its thing. So I, I guess I don't have insights into uh, what it's doing. I don't know if the verbose loading or something would tell me more. Okay, so yeah, as far as I know, FreeBSD spins up uh, uh, each vCPU one by one. So mm -hmm. if you have 44 uh, vCPUs, um, the time to spin up a single AP will stack up. Um, yep, yeah, so maybe um, it's not noticeable on uh, VMs with low CPU counts, but there's high CPU counts. And I suppose I can compare it to the actual hardware host booting, which indeed iterates over the same or more. VCPUs. Yeah, but the 
issue. So if you um, spin up an AP on the host, it um, you just send an interrupt to the uh, real CPU and the hardware does its stuff and it's very fast. Got it. But um, if you do it in Beehive, you send an, um, so yeah, you also send an interrupt to the virtual uh, CPU, but then Beehive emulates the um, behavior of resetting the CP vCPU and um, initializing or register. And this can take some time. Um, don't I don't know if someone ever have measured the time to hmm. spin up a single um, AP, but yeah, maybe some other guys will also notice that it's slow and um, yeah. So maybe I can try it by my own, and maybe we can find a solution for that. Cool. Uh, Colin Percival has been doing some amazing work on the FreeBSD boot process time. So I will make a note here of, hey, I wonder if setting his, his parameters uh, will help, will give us some insights. Um, I understand uh, a whole, uh, no much of the naming, but what is an AP in this context? An application processor. So ah, it's you. just a, a single a CPU. You have the bootstrap processor, which uh, is this vCPU which spins up your system and this starts all other uh, vCPUs and they are called application processors. So everything but the first logical uh, core. Oh, thank you. And I think um, if it's really the issue that launching the uh, APs is slow, uh, you can't really optimize it on uh, the guest side. So, yeah, because it's uh, emulated by Beehive and uh, there's no chance for the guest to speed, up, speed it up. So, one solution might be to send a broadcast instead of spinning up uh, each vCPU one by one. But, um, yeah, I don't think that it's the main reason. Uh, why it takes so long. And the oh. problem is, um, if you send, I, so the broadcast should work on real hardware, but I don't know. And I don't think it's worth to change it just for virtual machines. Um, have you tried uh, analyzing it with D-Trace to see how much time is spent where? That's where Colin has tools for this. And for me, it was pretty much a smoke test. Boot, build it, uh, run a build world on the host, spin up a VM, run the exact same OS version and everything, and just drop the results here. So yeah, uh, if you have some thoughts on what T-Trace probes would help there, I suppose I'm all ears. So one issue I can think of is that Beehive uh, um, has a syscall to set a, a register, but you only set one single register. So if you st um, st spin up a vCPU, you have to send many system calls just to reset all registers. So maybe we should switch over to send a whole a list of registers and uh, resetting all at once. So the patch of, uh, to implement uh, high numbers of vCPUs should tell you the name of the functions it's patching. And there's probably some function like vCPU or AP start or something in the kernel VMM code. And then if you just uh, timestamp them through function boundary tracing. You would get an idea. Um, so uh, is is it a linear? Is it a constant time per core, or does it get slower if you start uh, ten or thirty? So that could tell you if it's some some stupid uh, n to the power of two algorithm or something someone missed. Fortunately, John was 
very good about cross linking his reviews. The one I have down there that mentions the sys control might indeed do that. He's so, probably yeah, totally uh, valid questions. Enough. More of the developer call with John Preston, obviously, but hey, uh, the, you are welcome to go give this a try. I do have a CPU with 32, uh, a test system with 32 uh, logical cores, so I can test it. Cool. And I briefly have a an Intel system with that's like a silver processor, I believe. So yeah, I'll try to cool. squeeze a test in on that. I've only done it on Epic and a poor little HBZ220 that I thoroughly oversubscribed and had terrible performance with, but it worked. Anyway, uh, on the, uh, just related for what it's worth, kind of a heads up, John does have a syscontrol that is populated on loading vmm.co. Uh, it mentions the maximum number of vCPUs, which I suppose is to be a, oh, maybe a, safety belt. However, the moment you launch a second VM, it might sort of overstep that. So I, I, I hope I'm, he did give a technical description in IRC about what's going on there, but, but we'll see. We'll get his description of exactly what that should be. And Jan, if you got an R720, totally go for it. Uh, how many? Eight core. So, okay, that's definitely worth a test because the key point is that you, if you act uh, go beyond the original hard limit of 16 vCPU as well, that's that's a valid test of of this code. Anyhow, uh, in doing that, I found that I typed like uh, using just VM run, I typed 32 presumably bytes of RAM rather than uh, gigabytes of RAM <laughs> such that it through the error that I put in the... That's tiny. <laughs> that is tiny. And it was like a uh, uh, bu 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 corrupt symbol table for L64 sure, symbol lookup, et cetera. It doesn't fit. So I don't know if uh, there should be a little safety check that says like inadequate RAM rather than like, what the hell did you do? <laughs> and well, corrupt is a word that scares people. Please uh, don't because sometimes you want to test such configurations. This is true. In Fair enough. Of guests, but uh, it should maybe write a warning also to stand it out. And Beehive uh, humanizes all numbers. So if you, the config uh, parsing code uh, looks for suffixes and multiplies them mm -hmm. into numbers. So you can always say gigabytes, terabytes, whatever. Yes, I, I dropped the G and it did exactly that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, just Which FYI. Is something to be aware of when automating, because if you want to have it in them potent, either you have to expand those uh, yourself or uh, expand them before comparing if something changed. Mm -hmm. So that, that I guess does the same and it trips up uh, the ZFS. Uh, management module probably just putting a the warning immediately before the first line of that message you pasted in is ideal what would we consider the minimum to provide perhaps the virtual machine but no usable memory i don't know 32 or 64 max these days is expected for most kernels to even I don't know if anyone wants to run Windows 98 or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. wouldn't, it wouldn't be any useful peripherals. But I okay. can see a use case for very small open WRT or something, virtual machines, or a BSD router or something. Knock them BSD, baby. Anyhow. Maybe, <laughs> maybe so, I want to run an instance of, uh, of color fourth. Oh, right. <laughs> Tell us more about color fourth. It's just a version of fourth, but being, it's a very be, yeah, being a fourth, it's very s slim down and acts as its own operating system. It's even weirder than normal fourth because color, color has, has a semantic uh, 
yeah. component. So the color of your word, which is what Forf calls a function, has a significance if it's control flow, if it's a function name, if it's and so on. Yeah, rather than <clears throat> having. And I think if it's comp executed at compile time or at one time, and so basically, is it immediate or not? But I haven't looked at the implementation, but it's a really weird thought. One of the la later creations of uh, Chuck Moore. Chuck Moore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you could run mm -hmm. that in the loader, could you not? Which is fourth. Oh, absolutely. Friendly. Okay, cool. <laughs> no, no, in, so in fact, the, it's some of his later chip designs, he was actually using it as the assembler. Yeah. But uh, the fourth dialect used in uh, the old FreeBSD bootloader is why fourth has such a bad uh, reputation among FreeBSD developers because even among fourths, that's a terrible one. Okay. Well, you learn the something only every day. Upside to it is that it's very easy to embed uh, in bare metal C code. Cool. So um, besides that, I think a uh, good use case for VMs with very little RAM uh, <laughs> would be some um, unit tests because uh, then you don't need much RAM because you just need to spin up your small test and that's it. And yeah, Patrick brought that up in a recent developer call and amen, absolutely. Okay. I mean, I would, think, I, I would think we just set the, the number really low, something like 16K. If you don't have at least that, there's, you're not but, even on, you're, you're not even on something from the 1980s. 640k is supposed to be enough for everyone, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Bill Gates. <laughs> yeah, but for example, if you're using um, a UEFI boot, you um, have to put the boot loader uh, at the one megabyte, so below the one megabyte address. Okay, then do the, whatever the minimum would be for the UEFI makes sense to me. Even for unit tests, you probably wouldn't go below a 64 megabytes. Cool. Because we're not necessarily checking that it completely makes sense, just that it doesn't completely not make sense. And if you can't boot the machine anyway, that yes, doesn't make sense. By definition, at all. yeah, not a machine, if you will. Anyhow, that was just well, something I found. Go ahead. You could create a virtual machine without UEFI. With I suppose, load or something. I mean. It doesn't require any memory for runtime uh, services and so on. And Just that's where the Beehive load and the color fourth would come into play. Yeah. Yeah. Color fourth uh, Beehive load, right. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could integrate those anyway. Um, if there's nothing more on that topic, I'll simply say, hey, there's an ongoing discussion on jailed NFSD and Rick Macklerm saying, hey, how, how should we handle certain things? So I've linked that discussion there. It's in the current mailing list for FreeBSD. So, hey, I'm glad that's getting addressed. Anyhow, uh, Patrick, are you using Beehive in production in any way, shape, or form? Not yet. I'm actually the, one of the reasons why I'm jumping on. What use, use case. cases do you see? Uh, use cases for me would be, uh, <clears throat> I do a lot of satellite office stuff. So having one box that does a whole bunch of little things, little jobs for me would be, uh, that. that's, that's what I uh, see it being used for. Can you name some roles? Uh, I'm still evaluating to be quite honest, but, but like, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe a, little, a couple of little security jobs, a couple of little, you know, monitoring jobs, things like that. And at this very moment, I have someone looking at free PBX for what it's worth. And I was like, well, where do we put it? Um, for those looking at, say, 3CX, it's like, oh, they've just dumped support for 
their Nifty Raspberry Pi implementation. So if you're running your PBX on that Nifty Pi in the corner, you're done. So, okay, yeah. let's move to something else. Um, let's move to some did they Did and they dump yeah. um, ARM in general or just the old ARM um, on old Raspberry Pi? So did they dump ARM v6, ARM v5, or even ARM v7 and ARM v8? I think it's more a packaging question of take getting rid of this whole build environment that produces the Raspberry Pi image. I suspect fundamentally the code works on ARM, but I haven't looked too much closer. Oh, so they're no longer providing a ready to use SD card image. Exactly, yes. Uh, okay. Yep. Um, uh, free PBX. Uh, so obviously we're using Google Docs at this very moment and I've been using uh, for a single spreadsheet and a single doc, uh, Nextcloud with the Collabora live editing. And it is it has its quirks, but it is usable. And that is uh, promising. However, their build environment is all like system D and Linux and Docker based. So uh, Gibran is looking at perhaps seeing what, what can be spun out of that sort of that forced context. Because hey, so, uh, if I could spin that up on a free BSD VM on FreeBSD I, or jail, I'd be a very happy camper. Go ahead. So Nextcloud itself does work on FreeBSD yes, as a port, uh, but the Collabora stuff is just um, maybe legally licensed combination of open and closed source code, which only supports Linux. You may, you're probably able to uh, get. Oh, it would be worth attempting to get it to run under the Linux compatibility environment, but there's no chance to get it running natively because so there the, are yep. binaries which only support uh, Linux. Uh, but what about, is there any notion of system D in the Linux compatibility environment or is that so kernel tied that- um, like You would have to provide your own uh, service runners or startup mm. scripts, but- and those could be FreeBSD RC.D scripts. Got it. But, With uh, effort. <laughs> well, systemd unit files are fairly declarative of what the desired state is, unless they're using some of the more ridiculous uh, optional features, which almost no one bothers with. Uh, <laughs> there wouldn't be any really dependency on systemd activation. Uh, it's pretty because I think it's written in Java, the backend, so it's just um, with native code additions, mm -hmm. and that means that at least last time I checked, it was. And uh, you have to uh, provide an execution environment for that. Cool. But it wants to run all the time, so there is no fancy integration with socket activation or stuff like this. But it's probably easier to run the next cloud under FreeBSD and only run the uh, document editing in a Beehive VM that should be a lot more maintainable than trying to break it up and port it in its own jail or change root environment with Linux compatibility. Friend. The question is how much time and effort are you prepared to maintain it? Yes, sir. And the update process has indeed bitten me and my colleague a few times already. Uh, they do have a notion of auto update and then oh, no, they, for what um, it's worth, they're using uh, ba, 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 Nextcloud AIO all in one. Yeah. For what but, it's worth. So in my experience, the rep Upgrade support between major releases is very finicky and unreliable, but the uh, command line PHP script uh, works. One of the main problems is that you will commonly uh, run into execution timeouts or and then it, you can't continue through the web interface because you're stuck midway through the migration and it can be continued, but not it doesn't start up far enough to let you do it via the web interface. So if anything fails, 
which it will on a bigger instance, then you have to go through the OCC PHP script, which is in your uh, uh, web root. So it's easy to, uh, to run just PHP OCC uh, dot PHP and then your upgrade command. Okay. But uh, Are you using Collabora? No, not Collabora, but the base okay. uh, next cloud without all the sense features just for file layer. Sure, exchange. and it does that well, no question. I was mm. just blown away. Well, okay. <laughs> You've had issues? Yes, but okay. this, um, very worse things. Cool. Um, other, uh, I guess, on that very theme, use cases for, uh, I don't know, product, production VMs, we, I uh, would love to make our lives easier with. And hey, Patrick, your fresh insights are always appreciated. And, uh, and even Corvin, does your product and solution have support VMs that perform specific tasks or do you have that on your roadmap? So one interesting topic for us would be USB port pass through, maybe. Um, yeah, because we are mostly using the uh, so VMs for, for example, for user interfaces. And um, yeah, there it might be nice to uh, select which USB ports are passed to the VM and which one. Uh, can be used by the host. Uh, but my, so some time ago, I wrote a vert IO input emulation for Beehive. Uh, so yeah, maybe uh, this this is enough for our um, use cases. But uh, would be nice to have USB pass through. Right now, the only version to come close to what you're asking for is to get a motherboard with more than one USB PCI Express device and pass through some of your USB controllers. And then all of the, those ports connected to those controllers will be passed through implicitly. Yeah, but that's, that's not, not um, possible for us because we have closed small devices and we can't just add some PCI cards or uh, such things. Yes. And surprise there. Yeah, there is the poor, so there is a branch from UPP. Yes, uh, so just getting to that the and, doc here if you're watching along, go ahead. Yes, I've tested it some time ago, but so it was kind of working with a single keyboard or a single mouse, but um, yeah, it doesn't properly work and there are also some bugs they have mentioned on their website i think and some time ago i looked to, into the branch and there's no progress so i don't know if someone is working on it i've been reaching out to them and quite a few folks have graduated and so they seem a bit stalled but my email last week didn't get a response and obviously no one's had a chance to join today. I do hope they're able to forward some of that code, but it may be that we need to find people to take it over. So but I'm very glad you've tried that. that is how would that interact with uh, Capsicum sandboxing? Do they keep a file descriptor on the uh, slash dev slash USB uh, directory? So they are using libusb to reserve a device and um, scanning the events of the uh, USB device. Yeah, but let's say you uh, unplug and the keyboard and put in a hub and then reattach the keyboard. So you would get new USB devices and file descriptors and the old ones wouldn't help you anymore. Does it so not you... support hot uh, No, no, no. It, it, it supports hot plugging because libusb supports hot plugging. Um, you uh, pass through a specific port, not a device. You uh, say you would like to 
pass this USB port to the VM, and then mm -hmm. you can connect whatever you like to the port. And uh, I octals on the port file descriptor to get to all the devices. Yeah, so I don't know if how because... lib USB interacts with um, Capsicum, but so um, <laughs> so you just have to uh, say that you're using the iOctals lib USB users, and I think Capsicum should work. The problem is that, as far as I know, for each USB device you want to interact with through libUSB, do you have to open a device? So if you get a message on a port that a new device has been attached, you get its identity, and then you have to do perform an open system call on the device. Yes. Which I... is impossible once you are inside a Capsicum sandbox mode, unless it Lib USB knows to you uh, keep a file descriptor for the uh, slash dev slash USB directory around and uses open ad on that. Which last time I had to look at the lib USB code, I didn't find any uh, open ad calls, just open calls. But maybe we change yes. it. So be honest, I don't know. So. But they're valid questions nonetheless, and I've attempted to to document them. And if it's open underscore at, let me know. I, I don't know that. I'm not familiar with that. And Andrew, does your use case have a need for USB devices, such as sometimes license key dongles can be can be needed? Um, I think we got rid of the last of our stuff that used license key dongles cool. like five years ago. Five. Much to my joy. Yes, indeed. <laughs> we had a lot of uh, firewalls that did that and we got rid of them. Understood. Um, hmm. Okay, well, documented. It Hopefully, there are developers who are interested in that USB passer. I know Peter talked about it for years. I don't know if his interest continues in any way, shape, or form, but uh, in in USB pass through. But anyhow, great topic there. Uh, yeah, uh, Greg will have to wait for another meeting. That's just fine. Uh, other ideas, topics, questions. I'm also happy to talk website and media. The website was volunteered by somebody and I just years ago made some adjustments to make it just a little more concise and reduce a massive image to a smaller one. And from there, just kind of let it be. The heavier lifting has been done by the wiki and then countless random blog posts, articles, you name it. So I don't know if as if there are some opinions here on what exactly beehive.org should do, but I'm all ears and but but any massive suggestions require a little help because I've got my limited resources. Link to the main page. <laughs> if, well, if a lot of it's stored in the wiki, a link to at least a starting point into the wiki would be useful, probably. The problem with the FreeBSD wiki as it stands is that uh, a lot of information in there is still valuable, but out of date and not structured. It's just uh, okay. streams of consciousness dumped uh, over time. So it's not really curated documentation, but just some developer wrote down a few notes five years ago. Yeah, I was ago. hoping that wasn't just my observation. Oh, uh, yeah, observation well. is accurate. So they uh, they they do go kind of hand in hand and it's up to us for lack of a better term to kind of make yeah. that meet needs and andrew your sort of non FreeBSD perspective is very welcome because hey I, I there is very active development on illumos and it should be represented there um 
Well, I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure how well it, 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 it ever really will be. Because it's one, it's one of those things where it's like going, you know, going to, you know, an outside project to, to, to fill that in is, I think, always going to at least feel weird. Does that yeah. make sense? Uh, yeah. Um, thank you for the open ed call there. Um, yeah, and don't get me wrong, which Illumos distros are pushing Beehive beyond, say, uh, OmniOS, and I guess in theory, SmartOS, and, and I guess the others include it, but I don't know if that's, you know, a key focus. I, I cannot say, but I've definitely been using it on OmniOS. Um, Michael, did you get any feedback regarding the vid.io file system stuff? Is uh, Clara only looking into the uh, 9p based uh, direct uh, file system and code or also the fuse based one? Because there's vidfs 9p and then there is the, which is so confusing because there's also a vidfs, which is basically a fuse over uh, the vidio. Uh, to, for the brief answer, it is only the 9P work that Juniper produced and Steve Wills made, I think, a port of and just is uh, limited. Uh, no, nothing's, you know, it, long term run, uh, long term, uh, it would be nice to look at the VertFS. And I know Mark, Mike Larkin's team took a peek at it, but didn't come up with a deliverable. But uh, it, what is there something that motivates that question of supplier um, demand? More or less demand because it would be also nice to be possible uh, to just have a small, at most a small start, medium, and then a performant enough interface uh, on the file system instead of a block level. Understood. But. Is there a word IOFS option in Beehive already? Yes, Beehive in FreeBSD includes a 9P server, which is then exposed via a PCI device and the guest. And you're basically talking uh, 9P over ring buffers. Uh, okay. I wasn't clear it could show up in the guest. Is that avail Is that documented in any way, shape or form? The main page uh, includes what little you can configure. Got it. So I was getting confused. It's when just vidio 9p, vidio vidfs interface. And the only thing you can configure is uh, if it's read write or read only, the path to use as a base directory. And that's about it. Could you so, paste that text if it's in front of you, just in the chat? Um, sure. If it's handy, sure. I, it know. is. I have a man page open. Great. It's just in the Beehive man page. Thank you. Oh, Zoom copying. It is. It is something special. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Um, and the problem is that right now FreeBSD doesn't have, it has a server, but doesn't have a client. Uh, Linux does have a client so that it can mount it. And the codes, uh, which was just mentioned from Swords, uh, is a FreeBSD client for it. So FreeBSD imported the 9P server, but not the 9P client. But that's indeed the code that Juniper has to some degree the, produced. And yes, the kernel module is the uh, client part. Yes. OK. And what I haven't found oh, is, does it support just one uh, shared uh, 9P system? Or how the mount is supposed to know what to mount <laughs> hmm. if you have more than one uh, vidio 9p uh, device per guess, but I don't know if that's even allowed. 
Isly, this is useful if you want to have a shared directory between host and guest or multiple guests mm. without going through NFS, SMB, or other network file systems. And somewhat not necessarily orthogonal is that the Ganesha 9P server is available but has fallen out of support on FreeBSD because of the Python 2 to 3 migration. No, it hasn't fallen out of, uh, hasn't been thrown out of a pods tree because of the migration, but because of the upstream, namely oh. Python, the Python project, uh, finally stopping all live support for Python 2.7 and FreeBSD's refusal to include Python 2.7 anymore. Ah. It's not that. The Ganesha project, they're basically depending on uh, end of life Python versions as part of the build process. Uh, for what it's worth, NFS Ganesha K mod is still in ports, which is a bizarre notion of a separate um, kernel based module. What? That, that <laughs> module is required because NFS requires system calls to implement the NFS server semantics in user space, which FreeBSD normally doesn't have. The thing is that there is no atomic way to uh, check if uh, you would be allowed to open a file. The only way to do that is to change your process effective user ID to the user and groups you uh, want to check it for and then attempt reopen. Hmm. Okay. Um, the thing is in Linux, uh, because Linux um, to this day hasn't really understood that threads and processes are something different, um, doesn't implement system calls like changing the effective user and group ID uh, per process, but per thread. So if you have a multi-threaded process, you have to do some really nasty, yeah. ugly and racy synchronization between all threads, including uh, booting and uh, dying threads to uh, hold them all at a trampoline and then make sure that all make progress or non make progress to all switch uh, effective user ID normally to implement the POSIX semantic, but uh, instead uh, NFS Ganesha exploits this behavior to spawn a thread drop only the privileges in the thread to the user executing the NFS open, and then afterward use the file descriptor. And FreeBSD has no uh, lightweight way of doing that without spawning of a child process and handing back the file descriptor over a Unix domain socket. And the Kmod implements a system call to do what Linux do, does, namely dropping privileges temporarily for only one thread in a multi-threaded process. So the DNFS server can uh, respect access permission even wh while it's running as otherwise <laughs> root and would be allowed to uh, open all files in the file system. So basically it's taking advantage of a of an exploit in Linux. Awesome. No, of a design <laughs> um, artifact. The, 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 the hand, I, I would consider the handling of, of, of threads to be an exploit. Yeah, or at least something it very exploits likely. exploits a design flaw. Very, very likely to maybe, yeah. create will, security bugs. <laughs> No, in this case, it's not creating a security bug, but NFS Ganesha is one of the few corner cases where the Linux uh, lack of design is of advantage. Well, it's not, it's, I'm, I'm not saying it's creating one in, in this case, but it, require, it requires very, it sounds like it requires very careful attention to make sure you don't. Exactly. The problem is why are you doing with a thread which is supposed to um, have executed its last instruction, but can be uh, reanimated on its way uh, to stopping by a signal or something. And then mm -hmm. the signal uh, handler doesn't return or something. 
but instead does something else. Uh, for example, you're supposed to be dropping privileges and suddenly you had a thread still running as root on its way out and you send it after all the other threads have dropped uh, privileges. You send it a signal within your, because you've been infected with an evil um, signal handler you've just registered and so on. It's a very strange corner case. But it's just one of the reasons, for example, why, why the uh, Go standard library and none of the common Go uh, libraries uh, support dropping privileges at, at all because in Go, you uh, main is already running in a multi-threaded process because uh, the scheduler could have started an arbitrary amount of uh, runtime threads. And because of that, uh, and because they can no longer offer a clean way of uh, dropping privileges on uh, Linux, why all the Go demons um, expect you to start them as their runtime user and change your system in some way to make sure that they can bind all the required ports uh, and so on. Okay. So by default, Go demons no common common go uh, daemon supports uh, dropping privileges. It's uh, they always start as some non uh, super user, and if they want to bind, for example, port eighty, you have to help them. Or they're written as two daemons uh, forking and executing with file descriptor inheritance or parsing or something. But a running Go process through the common libraries can't drop privileges on Linux. And because Linux is a, an important platform, it, the standard library doesn't support it on any platform. Yeah. So I just remember that Vitaly sent mes a message about the time counter news just a second ago. Oh, so I will nice. look that up uh, while Perhaps if you go, I'm open to topics or I'd love to run through the FreeBSD 14 wish list if anyone has some ideas there. And Corvin, you're definitely on there. Multi queue networking. So uh, I package weight multi core network throughput between host and guest. <laughs> more offloading emulations on the right now uh, it the vitio net device in beehive is the minimal configuration so one queue per direction uh, and none of the optional offloading features which means it peaks around five to six gigabits on a fast cpu uh, per interface between host and guest while routing with a full 1.5 kilobyte MTU. Did we fundamentally address any of that with VNet or NetGraph? Uh, NetGraph, no. The, it's a limitation of the way the VIRT.io net device presents to the guest. It presents as a single queue uh, VIRT.io net device. It's optionally VIDIO net devices can have multiple queues per direction to allow each VCP to have its own networking queue so that you can use multiple uh, CPU cores in a guest efficiently. Is that behavior better on uh, Linux uh, or yes. Linux? I don't know about Lomos, but it's a lot better on QEMO and other hypervisors. It may even be that the E1000 emulation is more complete, but I'm not certain about that because lots of the cheaper E1000 devices are, work the same way, which makes sense for a gigabit ethernet interface because it's good enough for gigabit ethernet. Yeah, yeah. And hmm. Uh, the 
So you could work around that with equal cost multipath routing or um, LHCP or so on. Well, but over multiple interfaces. Can you link aggregate VM interfaces? I suppose so, but I don't know if you'd get say if they if you did say LACP. Uh, they were present as uh, full duplex Ethernet interfaces of the same speed and drop duplex. So yes, you can put them in, in an LHCP uh, group from a protocol point of view. I've never tried it. Well, can you fundamentally implement LACP without switch hardware? Came up a few months ago. Uh, yes, the question is how much CPU cycles do you have to throw at it? Interesting. <laughs> it's here then that then you have to do the triplets hashing or something similar in software. Got it. Uh, that is a long-term goal in my mind. I'm curious mm -hmm. if there are short-term goals for the FreeBSD 14 release. We just want to hammer home. Um, I reported just, on a few earlier, but if you're welcome to look at this. Just adding multiple queues uh, shouldn't be insurmountable for someone familiar with the code. Okay. So just adding multi-queue support shouldn't I'm leaning a, a bit out of the window here, but uh, <laughs> I will elevate now that. that the rest of the kernel in FreeBSD 13.1 and 2 is at a point where you can actually make use of those packet rates. Uh, it's the next bottleneck we have exposed. It used to be that the, there were Lots of other bottlenecks in the array for almost all con same configurations. And now that these bottlenecks have been tackled, this is the next one I've identified so far. Uh, I will say Brian V has been very quiet, who did much of the early Vertio work. I don't know if like Christoph Provost or Bjorn would be open to that. And I also don't know exactly what attempts have been made in the past, but if you think there's research that can be done to eliminate that, then uh, um, it's... So the, unless it's contamin, con uh, considered contamination of the mind of whoever is supposed to write the BSD license code, uh, the uh, Linux hypervisor code, must include an implementation because those present as multi queue devices. And the uh, vidIO guest driver already supports it in FreeBSD. It's just that the Beehive vidIO PCI, PCI device uh, emulation. Could that be in emulation. a separate package if someone were to jerry rig the Linux code? Mm -hmm. Only if you uh, are prepared to ship your own uh, Frankenstein version of Beehive. Right. Although that does raise the notion of Beehive modules, for lack of a better term, something pluggable. Uh, yeah, you could do that if you have a, say, a PCI uh, a API, which uh, shared library loaded via DL open could uh, interface with. Hmm. You would need a stable ABI or at least API uh, to write modules against. That would be an interesting, but that would be a longer term goal. Right. Amen. Uh, that will not happen in the next uh, month three or three months. Two. No, it won't. Let me put this in place. So I've noted that to some degree. And if you want to elaborate in on the document, please do. Uh, that said, if others have high and low level, short and long-term, preferably short wish list items to focus on. Uh, Vitali, I checked his mail. He said it's about two weeks before he can work on the time, update his count, time counter work. That's um, a Hyper-V clock and KVM clock for FreeBSD, which worked on Intel, but blew up on AMD. Uh,
and so yeah one of those which again uh, excited me was john's and excited corbin was uh one the of john's the things BC uh, go ahead worth trying would be uh, net map regression tests and documentation so net map or net, graph? net net map got it and sure uh, looking over whatever there was potentially in the net uh, graph um, mid IO backend. But uh, net map regression tests and what? Uh, and documenting oh, the results first. because uh, it's hard to know even what's supposed to work regarding Beehive and net map. Mm -hmm. And what was only ever in an experiment in a private repository at the University of Pisa and similar places. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, with netmap pipes and veil ports and so on. Sure. I see mm. Luigi's talk at BSD count on exactly that, but yes, he's in an academic context. And the other thing, yeah, right. Luigi has given great talks and published really good papers about it, but uh, he even uh, shared patches, but uh, patches against FreeBSD 10 are no longer useful. Mm -hmm. And some of it has been upstream, but uh, the best or the most complete documentation I found on it are the Russian uh, only uh, CBSD examples. Uh, it's... Sure. When I tried it in FreeBSD 12, it was just a kernel panic generator instead of a packet generator. Okay. Uh, Andrew, is it safe to say that the time counters are still kind of top priority from your perspective on Lumos? Because I believe that code would be fully agnostic between Probably, and um, Lumos. I still need to go through and do all the test testing stuff that I said that I was going to do last week. Sure. Understood. And while Illumos does not have a 14 release to look forward to, it is a good motivator over in FreeBSD land. So I, I'm hoping to get just some of these 90% ready projects to the across the finish line. Uh, and Jan, you mentioned the CTL tags. That's very much where Mav is making progress and has it next on his to-do list. I forwarded him a little gift certificate I received, but that's so orthogonal. But mention, uh, what do you mean exposing them to Bert? I um, the thing is missing that, there. Um, the truncation uh, happens in at least one place. So um, just increasing them in CTL only makes it possible to get end-to-end 64-bit -end tagging of SCSI commands. Uh, it doesn't help the vid.io SCSI uh, guest driver if the tag is still uh, truncated in Beehive because it's cast to in somewhere. Yes. So uh, it has to be 64-bit uh, uh, integer types all the way through to avoid truncation. Got it. Uh, yeah, that is very much a motivator. Although you put your nose into the BirdIO code on, on Beehive more than anyone, did you not, when you tried to run some workarounds? I tried a workaround, and it, the workaround wasn't enough. And I lacked the Thank time. You, to find uh, to understand the code, which dequeued the responses to know at which point it uh, would uh, reconsider using reusing a tag. What I would have to do is to implement my own uh, tag allocator 
and that's a different kind of problem because of to implement that i would have to understand the whole locking system in place there and yeah my uh, attempt was to use a um 32 bit atomic uh, counter as tag allocator under the um optimistic assumption uh, shared with other SCSI uh, stacks that no uh, command will take long enough that uh, it's still pending when the 32-bit uh, counter overflows. And that if this should ever happen, uh, either you uh, just accept whatever happens uh, and hope that the um, SCSI uh, targets detect this or the host bus adapters, which the CTL stack does. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the command is uh, just uh, aborted and retried with a new tag, which works real well, which is why despite all the uh, dire warnings the kernel uh, emits under load, right now uh, I haven't managed to uh, cause data loss or file system corruption. Okay. Uh, with it. So Fio with doesn't complain about data loss. Uh, throughput is acceptable. It's just that sometimes during a tech collision, uh, it will um, abort and retry a command and lock the fact that something which really, really shouldn't happen was observed. Okay. Got There's it. one corner case where yep. I'm uncertain if CTL um, does the right thing because uh, according to my um, understanding of the SCSI uh, specifications, or at least the um, drafts uh, commonly um, percolating through uh, random university websites because uh, the um, final version, which is supposed to be identical except for the draft marker, uh, states that if the tag cannot be losslessly uh, encoded in um, eight bits, then the, the CTL code is supposed to respond with a different error, which does not include the truncated tag because uh, the, in the extended sense code, there's only enough space to encode eight bits of the tag and including uh, eight of the the last eight bit of the already truncated 32 bit tag <laughs> of the 40 uh, 64 bit uh, pointer um, and then doesn't make a lot of sense because by definition it cannot be even close to unique so it's not really uh, useful for error reporting and the fix of that would be to use an other code, but the, the handling of it is identical. So both uh, errors are handled in the same way. So it doesn't matter for FreeBSD guests because FreeBSD doesn't care to extract the bit except for logging purposes. Nothing but the uh, kernel debug output um, does look at the uh, 8 bit tag value encoded in the extended sense code. Alrighty then. Um, that said, uh, Corvin, while we have you, I put on the list your OVMF work. Is that something that's looking like it will reach current soon enough to be in 14? So uh, I'm not sure what you mean with my OVMF support. So the, the, I... you the. the is it on the table to load an OVMF firmware without modification of it? I haven't managed to do it on my own system yet. Okay. So I don't know why. Uh, because the OVMF uh, executes successfully and then it starts a bootloader, for example, uh, grab if you um, if you're booting Linux, mm -hmm. and then grab dies, hmm. and I don't know why. So 
there seems to be something different uh, in the QEMA OVMF than in the Beehive OVMF, and I don't know what. Um, yeah. But we are close to it. Um, so, yeah. So we are close to the uh, the upstream beehive is close to my uh, own state for our own got it branch. um if you have any free interrupts godspeed and yawn to your question in chat i i'm pretty sure steve wills created a 9p client it might be, it's probably in the history of this of yes uh, he minute. does and there are Lots of um, reviews in the in the FreeBSD fabricator on it, and here is a link to the Please. repository I found containing Thank it. You. Okay, not to aggressively change subjects there. Sorry about that. But um, getting that available uh, in a usable state and available as an out of three kernel module from ports and packages would be already 95 percent of the solution okay for more for my my potential use case where it would be just sharing for example the sources uh, i want to compile in a guest system or something so if I have a FreeBSD development virtual machine and I want to have the uh, FreeBSD Git repository from my home directory uh, mounted into a virtual machine, that would be something where 9P would be nice to have instead of having to set up an NFS server and mount it. Amen. And I very much welcome your help prioritizing these because uh, if you're watching the screen uh, I'll post the link again so, but I'm kind of dead serious I'm I'm doing something every day on some little corner of these <laughs> so uh, getting um, at least SCSI to work without warnings and a guarantee that it's supposed to work like that would be very important to me personally, then high packet rate networking would be uh, useful to a lot of people, I think, because FreeBSD is now the point where this is the next bottleneck for uh, sure. VM network throughput. Uh, these days, it's almost to be expected that production uh, deployments will have at least 10 gig networking. Correct. And you don't want uh, to enforce um, less noisy neighbors by limiting them to five, four or five gigabits per second uh, by limiting their packet rate per interface. Sure. Um, so this looking into this could be quickly become important to lots of production users. Agreed. The next uh, thing, yeah, what? So hmm. I have separated out established PRs because, well, it's yep. it's closer to being finished rather than a new repo that's just not hitting the tree. Those should almost be first insofar as they're technically present but not uh, working anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, feel free to comment all, all, and add out items all you want, the more information provided, the better, because that makes them more actionable. But progress is definitely being made. And we are at about an hour and a half in. Any other topics to discuss? I'll make a note in the minutes of that discussion we just had. As far as significant releases go on the uh, OmniOS side, our next uh, major release is in May, which is a long-term stable. 
Okay, that actually follows the FreeBSD schedule remarkably close, and it's probably published somewhere. I should include that. Let's go see. Uh, free... You you want to know the OmniOS schedule? Uh, yeah, post it, and let's. I'll just throw in both of them. That's exactly it. Thank you, sir. Uh, release engineering. Great. Um, copy. Thank you, sir. That um, goes right up on top. I do have another uh, simple, nice to have uh, one that would be documenting the differences between the uh, Beehive command line flags and the config file names, because sometimes there are mi minor differences where what's combined into a single argument and the command line is split into multiple key value pairs in the uh, config file format. And the, the potentially usable keys aren't documented. And it's not doc really documented in a way which jumps into the eye that you can predefine uh, keys to be expanded later to pass in some variable. Okay. Uh, I think. That is wise, and I will here and now mm -hmm. separate out a documentation section because documentation is something that so many more people can participate in, such that there is now netcraft documentation. And then, sorry that I was mid posting and pasting. Could you say that was to document the uh, the uh, uh, config file format for the for um, Beehive configuration mm -hmm. via configuration file, because it's not one to one the uh, arguments uh, you can pass through, which are documented in the main page. Sometimes there are small differences, and I had to look at the uh, config loading code to find out how to split up uh, some arguments when using a config file. And uh, the documentation should really point your nose at it that you can pass in a key value pair on the command line, then load the config file and continue with your configuration. Uh, so okay. for example, you can could pass in something like the CTL device to use for Viet IO SCSI on the command so use a combination line, then, of command line and no, uh, config file. If you look at the main page of yeah. Beehive, yeah. in at least FreeBSD 13 and newer, you there's the normal configure uh, way of doing things like dash L for or so, and so on, or dash S to yeah. pass in PCI. And there's the newer way of doing it by passing a config file. Yes. There's an intermediate mode where you can pass in single key value pairs to the uh, so, and with dash O. So dash O variable equals value. And you can use dash O, then load the config file and reference the variable defined via dash O in your config file through a verbal expansion with percent uh, open uh, bracket braces, closing braces. And that way, for example, I could write a startup script, which uh, sets up a CTL uh, port for the VM, exposes this its uh, Z volts as uh, SCSI uh, targets over this port and then hand in the path to the port um, for use by the vidio SCSI uh, driver on the Beehive host side. And I didn't have to dynamically generate a config file for this to support this. Instead, I could just, um, yeah. Pass nice. it in okay. on the command line and have a static configuration file which would just expand a variable which is predefined. And that's 
really and really neat feature you only discover by rereading uh, the, <laughs> the small by creatively rereading the man page after you found it in the code. Ah, okay. If, yeah, that is indeed good. The, Go ahead. Have you seen the behalf config man page? Yeah, it, I have. And it's incomplete. It. Yes, maybe write it, a bug for it. It's incomplete. I have found it, but it doesn't really include all the information. Yeah, but it should. Yes, it would be the right place for it. So if you find a key which is missing, either fix it and uh, create a merge request yeah. or uh, maybe write a bug so someone else can fix it because we should uh, work on including all keys in the map page. Yeah. I have to look up my um, Ansible templates to find out which keys uh, are missing. But there was at least one or two keys missing. Please grab that, yes. Uh, I will make that bright red because that it's as simple as that. I mean, the, the functionality really is there uh, and it's John's code and it's ex ex it's excellent, uh, but it's under documented like so many things. And I just forgot about it because once I was over it, it didn't bother me anymore because I just knew where to look it up again. Can you remind me the name of the Beehive config manual page? It's the, the search. Beehive button. underscore conf. Thank you. I did not have the underscore config. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'll lose the ig. Uh, and no. there's a, a, a special one um, called config dump, which is also useful because it's basically a poison uh, key. And if it's set to true, uh, it just dumps the configuration and exits without starting the guest. It's a nice way to basically transform, uh, convert existing startup uh, curses into uh, uh, the uh, created config. Got if it. you want to move your existing VMs to a, a config file. Definitely. Yeah, and that, even that was a slightly un counterintuitive when I first tried yeah, it. Oh, it's no, it's documented the... in the main page. Oh, it's totally, but if you leave your flag in, you accidentally get the, the uh, you have to remember to either exclude the dump flag. Yep. But anyway, no biggie. The problem is that this is all just reference documentation. What we're missing is, uh, it's book style documentation with a, a practitioner's documentation a and not a reference documentation to look up a detail you vaguely remember, but to learn about it <laughs> and how to solve yeah, problems with it. That's hard to maintain. You can look yes, into it is. our wiki and you see it's exactly. completely wiki outdated the and for that's the this. issue. Mm -hmm. oh, that's the main issue if you do such kind of um, tutorials because they will be outdated in a few years and what? it's probably there's probably no one who is maintaining it and that and it's important to write in this expectation to document when you did this on which version really i did this in December of 2020 and uh, 2022 and uh, on FreeBSD 13.2 and this and this worked. Yeah, so but that... it doesn't help you if you are on FreeBSD 15 and you see, oh, it it's from FreeBSD 13 and uh, it's it outdated. Does. If it's clearly states that this used to work, you've learned an important detail that one, the documentation you've just read is out of date because it hasn't been updated. And this used to exist, it probably still exists, go looking for how to do it today. <laughs> the concepts of don't change only the, the syntax, for example, it used to be that you just configured the num number of CPUs and now you uh, describe the topology of the, the CPUs. 
Blood. There is yeah, a concept of a number of CPUs. To, yeah, but you just have to learn to read map pages. Because yes. this is the place which we should yeah. really maintain. And yeah, Ricky would be nice, but it's very hard. The problem isn't learning to read man pages, at least uh, to a certain point. The problem is no knowing what's possible and learning it short of reading the whole implementation front to back. Uh, no disagreement. Uh, that all said, we've gone about an hour and a half in. Shall we uh, move on? And I do encourage you to comment on that document in, in place. And of course, file PRs as you're describing as you go. And Corbin, you make a good point there that the vCPU work might need testing on all topologies. I'm thinking it should work, but you never know. Yes, of course, you have to test it on many uh, systems. Cool. Yes. And OK, any final thoughts? I do need to get moving. Thoughts, observations, concerns, reminders. Then I think, how about we call it at 1040 Pacific and talk in a week? Sounds good. Super. Thank Let's you, everyone. Very good discussion. I appreciate that. Have a good weekend.